Have you ever had to write a scope of works to engage a subcontractor and had no idea where to start? Or have you ever had to make important decisions about how to allocate scope or risk to a subcontractor and didn't know the best way to go about it? Well, this video is designed for you. My name is Tim and I'm a project engineer with lots of experience on the design and construction of major infrastructure projects. I've been building short courses to teach the fundamental construction management skills to engineers and other construction management professionals. So far, we've had over a thousand students enroll in our courses. Each course is loaded with hours of content and practice activities to make sure you're equipped with the skills you need to excel at your job. This short video is an extract of our course on construction procurement management, where we'll take you through how to write a scope of works to engage a subcontractor and get quotes. We'll talk about what a scope of works is, what it contains, how to write one, and how to make important scope and risk allocation decisions. If you find this video interesting and useful, check out the link in the below description to our complete Udemy course. Hi, and welcome to section 3.3, the scope of works. In this section, we're going to talk about the key document we use to define the works a subcontractor is required to perform. The scope of works will ultimately form part of the contract. In this section, we'll talk about what it is, what it contains, key, attachment, key attachments, the process of allocating responsibility, and review an example scope of works attached to the course notes. The scope of works is a key contractual document that defines what work a subcontractor is required to perform. Effectively, it spells out what services we are asking them to provide and will be a key part of any subcontract. Attached as an appendix, it's attached as an appendix to the contract. The scope of works is written by the construction team, so the project engineers and senior project engineers responsible for delivering the works. It needs to contain a high level of detail and should be clear about the key scope and risk allocation as it will end up being used to manage the works. When reviewing the scope of works, the potential subcontractor should understand exactly what they are being engaged to do and consequently be able to quote with confidence. For example, if you're getting quotes to supply and install a drainage line, it should be clear who's providing the drainage pipes, the depth of excavation, what compaction requirements there are, and what drain testing requirements. The specific contents of a scope of works will vary based on the performer or template you're using. As mentioned in section two, during the planning phase, we need to develop performer documents that can simply be filled out. The scope of works performer document should have the structure and key headings showing what information is required in the scope of works. Typically, a scope of works document will contain the following as a minimum. The project background, a general, high-level outline of the subcontractor's scope, a detailed scope section listing out each de deliverable and what is required, other requirements and expectations around quality, safety and program, we'll touch on those more later, and a list of relevant attachments such as design drawings, specifications, project management plans and so on. The scope of works needs to reference all the key supporting documents that will help define what works the subcontractor is required to perform. This includes design drawings, so any relevant drawings relevant to the tender of scope, technical specifications, these are specifications and standards that may incorporate elements of the design, but also detail construction tolerances and requirements. Procedures, so project out policies and procedures such as the safety management plans, these would detail things like what safety outcomes the contractor needs to achieve and the project schedule. So a complete or broken down project schedule defining the time outcomes the contractor needs to achieve. Now we're familiar with what's contained in the scope of works and what documents are referenced. Let's look at what the primary purpose of the scope of works is for. The primary purpose of the scope of works is to clearly allocate responsibility to the subcontractor. This responsibility consists of both scope and risk. In addition to the scope of works, we'll define this responsibility through the form of subcontract chosen and the contract terms and conditions. The contract scope is the work the subcontractor has been engaged to complete. This is what they need to get paid 
do to get paid. This needs to be clearly defined and the contractor needs to clearly understand what they are being paid to do. This means defining the works to be completed, the staging of the works, the required performance requirements and standards, and the deliverables and sub-deliverables. It's critical for these things to be clearly and accurately defined to avoid disputes during the delivery stage. Let's quickly go through an example you can, so you can see what we mean when we talk about scope allocation. Let's imagine we're procuring a subcontractor to re reinstate and replace a section of tram tracks. Similar to the works being undertaken in the picture on the right hand side, let's imagine some of the spot possible scope allocation decisions we'd be faced with and need to answer. Should the subcontractor be responsible for the removal of existing asphalt, traffic management, line marking, subgrade reinstatement, or defect rectification? These are the type of things that would need to be clearly defined in the scope of works. Risk is the exposure to unplanned or unexpected events or circumstances. Construction projects involve a multitude of risks that need to be effectively managed to achieve successful project outcomes. Through the contract and supporting documentation, we need to clearly define who is responsible for managing and bearing the consequences or gains if these risks eventuate. There are huge numbers of things that can go wrong in construction projects, and we need to clearly define who is responsible for managing and bearing the responsibilities of these risks. So let's start by talking about some general risk allocation principles. The general principle with risk allocation is the party should be allocated to risk when the party's in control of the risk, the party has the capacity to manage and mitigate the risk, the party benefits from controlling the risk, and the risk pl placement leads to better project outcomes. So what this effectively means is you want the risk to be managed by the party best place to manage it. So when procuring work from a subcontractor, it makes sense that you get lump sum pricing. This means you're passing on the productivity risk to the subcontractor. However, if that subcontractor is not completing the design, it wouldn't make sense to pass on the risk of design errors to the subcontractor, as they have no power to control it. Risk allocation is a fine balance. Allocate too little risk, and the principal will pay unnecessary and excessive variations when risks eventuate, as well as being exposed to risks that could have been better managed by the contractor. However, when a principal allocates excessive risks, they transfer unmanageable risks, which result in contractors putting very high premiums on them. The diagram on the right hand side is a visual representation of this balancing act. On the low end of the scale, the value of the risk to the principal may be more than the subcontractor's premium for managing the risk. That is because the risk would likely be better managed by the subcontractor, while on the other end, transferring an unmanageable risk to a contractor will result in the contractor pricing an excessive contingency and likely being higher than the true value of the risk. Let's now look at some examples of construction risks. As we said previously, risks are things that can go wrong. Listed out on the slide are four of the most common construction risks. Take these as examples and use them as frameworks to think about the other sorts of construction risks. Firstly, design risk is a massive risk on all projects. Design is the development of the project technical solution in compliance with the project requirements. Design risk is the possibility that the design is wrong or defective. For example, if the design for a power cable is wrong and doesn't energize a circuit properly, who's responsible for pulling out and re replacing that cable? That's a design risk. Next is time risk. Who is responsible for the completion of the project scope within the allocated time frame? For example, say you have a subcontractor building the foundations of a bridge and another subcontractor completing the structural steel. If the subcontractor is late in building the foundations, you could potentially be hit with delay claims from the structural steel subcontractor. This is an example of the time risk. Next is cost risk. Who is responsible for delivery of the project within budget? This is a critical one, as projects often face cost blowouts, and effective management of project cost is critical. If the contractor is on a fixed fee contract, then they are responsible for managing costs while they are on a cost reimbursable contract. 
then the principal faces the risk of escalating costs. Finally, quality risk. Who is responsible for the workmanship and quality of the works? Who has to fix the defects when they arise? For example, if the welding on the base frame of a building doesn't meet the quality requirements, who is responsible to rectify this? Quality, cost, time and design are all key construction risks. But in reality, there are hundreds, if not thousands of things that can go wrong on construction projects. And it's critical that the contract clearly defines who is responsible for managing these risks. So let's imagine a brief example where we were working as a project engineer procuring an earthworks package. You need to define in the scope of works who is responsible for some of these key risks faced during delivery. Pause the video and try to spend 5 minutes writing down some of the things that could go wrong in the delivery of an earthworks package. Try thinking about what would happen if the geotechnical conditions were different than what you expected. What if there are unknown in-ground services? such as gas or electricity? What happens if productivity is lower than expected? These are all examples of risks that need to be defined in the contract. Let's wrap up this section by reviewing the example scope of works for a street lighting civil contractor attached. Have a read through the document and look at its structure. It's an overly simple example but covers off the key points, defining what the subcontractor is required to do, and references the key supporting documentation. Now we've introduced the scope of works, we're going to move on to talking about we're going to move on to talking about the pricing schedule, another key contractual document.